For a long time in Europe, people's beliefs were largely determined by the church, and behavior was supposed to follow religious edicts. But in the past few centuries, the nation-state has replaced the church, and nationalism has replaced religion. We grow up with beliefs that seem correct because everyone else assumes them to be true. They're like water to a fish, something you don't realize you can question. But I find when you really examine them, the assumptions we hold as a culture just don't hold up. My whole channel is an assault on those assumptions, so, you know, subscribe. But more to the point, this video is part four of a series questioning what we grow up learning about countries. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the Online Riot. Nowadays, many things get described as cults, and while it's often a wild exaggeration, it's also sometimes accurate. People want to believe in something bigger than themselves, a force more meaningful than money and work. If that force is an ideology we're indoctrinated into from birth, that's where many people are going to turn to find that meaning. Some people are going to make nationalism their whole personality. You see how nationalism is used to influence our behavior most clearly in a crisis. Even if the state instigates the crisis, like by starting a war or closing borders, the ruling class appeals to nationalism to gain recruits and volunteers and intimidate everyone else into obeying. But nationalism isn't just being tricked into going to war. It means support for all kinds of policies. The policies imposed on a national or federal level have to be justified in terms of the good of the country, as there's this assumption that, you know, if something's good for the country, according to the government and its institutions, it must be good for me too, right? I've said this before, but it begs repeating. You can have freedom or you can have conformity. You can't have both. Nationalism kills freedom and demands conformity. When religious orders ran the schools, kids were taught the church's values. Now schools are run or regulated by the state. They teach many of the same values, actually, like obedience, hard work, and punishment. Instead of an expansive and liberating education, we're taught a single, authoritative viewpoint on the world. The acceptable opinions on everything. The cult of nationalism doesn't allow for critical thinking, which is why they don't teach it in school, so most people never get a chance to learn it. But if you're a member of our cult, you are allowed to support oppressive policies and say it's because you've thought carefully and reached the conclusion on your own. People who want to impose a single, strictly limited way of thinking on children will actually claim to oppose propaganda and indoctrination. How could you possibly recognize propaganda and still have faith in this divisive, authoritarian entity that treats you like a pawn? If they've never reflected and unlearned the patriotism they picked up as children, they probably have very little ability to recognize propaganda. Some of the most persistent beliefs are the ones we learn about countries. We learn they exist in the same way an object or a person can exist. We learn how my country is supposed to work, how its institutions work to serve the people. We learn it's special, different from all the others, with its own special history and unique destiny. What many people never realize is these beliefs are just the words of dead guys who said those things so they could rule over people in their time. We get it drilled into our heads from childhood because the rulers of today find it useful too. If you identify with a country, you're part of a community that you're supposed to be proud of. You go on living a life of trusting the rulers who make you feel the proudest. It often gets asked why people join cults, but they don't. People don't join cults. They join organizations with charismatic leaders to improve their lives. Or political movements to turn their beliefs into policy. Adherents aren't necessarily especially gullible. They just don't realize they could be questioning the whole arrangement. The leaders are highly skilled at coming up with reasons. 
You don't know you've joined a cult. It turns into a cult without you realizing it. Going from one social club to all your social activity to your community, and eventually it's all you've got. Cults tend to demonize and then cut you off from dangerous outsiders with their dangerous ideas, like states do with borders. They have their rules, their laws and constitutions, and some of them threaten members who go against the orthodoxy, just like the so-called justice system does. If you become a member of the cult of the nation, either by being born into a family of members or by passing a series of tests of your suitability, you're expected to conform in thought and action. Adherents are supposed to believe in something that doesn't really exist. I explained in part one about the imagined community, the belief that as a nation, we're this community of people I love so much, even though I don't know them and don't like half of them. We're supposed to believe the state is a leader that represents us, grants us rights and freedoms, and that without all those institutions, life would be chaos. The nation-state claims to be, an to be able to answer life's big questions and provide meaning by giving people something bigger than themselves to believe in and work for. The symbols and rituals of the imagined community take on a sacred quality, which is why, for example, burning or just modifying a flag is commonly referred to as desecrating it. It's a symbol of our deity, the nation-state. Nationalism is one of a group of inherently conservative ideologies like patriarchy and white supremacy that make people feel they have a stake in a system that exists to oppress them. If you identify with your oppressors, you see your own oppression as liberation. Those who expect you to conform to nationalist ideals often have lots more rules they expect you to follow and standards they expect you to meet. You're told to follow all the laws, for example, even if I don't. Even if the laws don't matter or make sense, you still need to follow them and deserve to be punished for violating them. Even though nobody really follows the law, we claim to follow the law because we want us to be seen as virtuous for holding the values we're told to value. You gotta get a job or start a business, even if it provides zero value to anyone but a bunch of shareholders. Sure, what you do is none of my business and doesn't affect me, but I'll judge you if you don't have a job. And if you're poor, getting welfare, or homeless, well... <laughs> I have plenty of reasons not to sympathize with you. You gotta pretend all the stuff we pretend, too. If we say this is the greatest country ever, you gotta say it, too. If we believe in a glorious and unblemished history, that's your history now. To disagree is to invite punishment, like ostracism or violence. Holding other values can be difficult, because nationalism attempts to subordinate other values to it. Look at people who try to be both Christians or Muslims and nationalists, or patriotic socialists. None of them adhere to the universalist and egalitarian aspects of their ideologies because they conflict with the inherently hierarchic and discriminatory nature of the nation-state. Nationalism requires limiting membership in the community, believing in national friends and enemies, using force to maintain social hierarchy, and paying lip service to whatever the country is said to stand for. In a crisis, you're supposed to throw everything else you believe out the window and fall in line for the sake of vague ideals like the nation, the nation's security, or even its place in history. Because nationalism gets you to identify with the country, it appeals to your sense of vanity. Some people indulge their individual vanity, while others prefer collective vanity. Some go as far as to let nationalism swallow all other aspects of their identity. They only do things that are symbolic of my country, like in the US maybe hunting bald eagles and putting fake cheese on apple pie. That's disgusting. It's American. They like things associated with the country, like masculinity, strength, anti-intellectual contempt, and so on. 
What they don't understand is their identity was manufactured for them in offices by powerful people to justify their policies and sell products. That's why they eat so much bacon, and presumably the only reason anyone would just drink beer in a world of better drinks. Everything else is off limits because other drinks are not manly like beer, and illegal drugs are not the patriotic kind of drugs. Wouldn't want to risk opening my mind. Like occults, the country seeks power and control over its unsuspecting adherents while promising them it exists to improve their lives. We need this power over you, the system says, in order to serve you properly. It extends control over people's choices, their money, even their personal relationships by creating legal incentives to form monogamous heterosexual nuclear families. People love to scrape the bottom of the can for reasons why their country is different. Obviously, cultures vary, but most countries are structured roughly the same. They all have states imposed on them from above. All states have similar structures and laws, which create rich and poor people. All countries have nationalists who want homogeneity in a heterogeneous world. All countries are sites of indoctrination that pretend the mundane is special and the unique needs to be crushed. The propaganda exploits our senses to blur the line between you and the state. It exploits our idea of kinship by telling us everyone in this country is our family. It teaches us to be proud of things we've never done, like things in history supposedly accomplished by the country, and ashamed of things like when a group of people we've never met lose at an activity with no long-term impact. It teaches us suspicion and even hostility towards outsiders and anyone not following the rules. It teaches us to be competitive and violent in case the ruling class wants to start a war. When nationalism takes over the brain, we don't care about other causes. My country is the cause, which seems to mean putting flags up everywhere and lying to children. Any grievances we have as workers against the people who own everything, we're supposed to forget about them and fight for a greater purpose. So we'll stay poor and they'll stay rich, but there'll be flags. I don't want to know how badly my country treats poor people and disabled people because I want to assume they're being taken care of. Racism is bad, so if you tell me you face racism, maybe every day, or that the system itself is inherently racist, well, I don't want to hear that. Maybe in the past. But now there's basically no racism here. To the extent people identify with the country, implying the way the country works is inherently racist sounds like saying they're racist. And no one likes to admit being racist. So your experience must be isolated because racism is mild and rare, and my beliefs remain firmly in place. When we try to love unconditionally a faceless institution like the nation state that will spray us with tear gas for asking for justice, we're gonna believe it's propaganda. It provides us with answers, strokes our collective ego, and wraps us in reassuring words. So we want to believe. So we accept what we learned in school and ignore all the signs that point the other way. It's really hard to question beliefs once they settle in. We let the ruling class build a hierarchy in our minds of who's better than who and divide ourselves off from the undesirable types of people that we don't know anything about actually, but I have a vague impression and that's enough. Just picking out the places I want to avoid when I sail across the world. We tell ourselves, this is the best country ever, so other places aren't really worth learning about. And my country can't do no wrong, so all the people and events and centuries of history that show my country in a bad light are anomalies. Our true history, the one I learned in school, proves we're better. If not the best, then at least better than that country next door. I hate those guys. Nationalism tricks people who have no material interest in the status quo to support imposing it on everyone else. No one under this territory is allowed to be free of the grasp of the nation-state. Why not? Well, 
to a nationalist, it's obvious. If you're in my country, you have to follow my rules. Sure, I didn't make the rules. In fact, no one ever asked me if I approved of them. But my country wrote them, so I follow them and enforce them on others. If the rules say no freedom, then no freedom for anyone. Sorry, but conforming to unnecessary and harmful rules is more important than freedom. I believe in freedom, but only where and when the government has authorized it. If a law limits privacy or a freedom you used to have, I have reasons why you shouldn't have it. In these days of scary things, freedom is a luxury we just can't afford. Many nationalists consider themselves the owner of the country, and you can see it when they tell you you're not allowed to criticize, or if you don't like it, you should leave. Authoritarian ideology like nationalism is not fond of dissent. Don't criticize my country. You don't like something that I had nothing to do with? Now I can't stand to be on the same continent as you. I demand conformity of thought within this political boundary. They think they're kicking you out of their house when really they're excommunicating you. Thanks to our indoctrination, we can hold what are clearly inaccurate or contradictory beliefs, like I'm open-minded, but you should leave the country if you criticize it. We can complain for an indefinite period of time about specific aspects of the supposed country while simultaneously loving the idea of the country and wanting to preserve it forever. The country isn't millions of people forced to associate under the rule of the state. It's free people voluntarily coming together in community. It's not a constantly evolving culture affected by other cultures. It's one self-contained culture that has found answers the others haven't. Sure, a culture's always changing, but we don't want immigrants because they'll change it in the wrong way. They don't love freedom like we do, so we shouldn't grant them the freedom to enter this huge landmass I've been told belongs to me. Worship tends to require ignoring unpleasant facts, so the deity or hero can appear glorious in any light. We become experts at coming up with reasons. Sure, there was slavery here for a couple of hundred years, that doesn't represent us, because my country's all about freedom, really. And that part of history has no effect on the present, probably. Because everyone's treated equally now. I tell myself, my country is fine the way it is, so anyone who wants to change it is wrong. Unless, of course, they're trying to make it more oppressive. Tighter borders, more police, more cages, these are considered solutions to a nationalist because their function is to prevent change and punish people for demanding it. It's like posting guards at the exits to stop members from leaving. After all, if they're not patriotic, which means wanting more borders and police and cages, they don't deserve freedom. Only if you follow all the laws and customs and hold the dominant beliefs are you allowed to be free like us. Some have likened the nation state to a death cult. From a young age, you're expected to sacrifice everything for my country. If my country says it's time for war, you have to go. But you want to go. Like a cult, believers would rather kill and die than allow harm to come to the institution. You were taught to believe in my country, so you let the state or the media you follow tell you who your enemies are and how to fight them. You'll get honored as a warrior for my country. You'll get statues and tombs in special cemeteries. You'll get parades to honor you before and after you go to war. Can you think of another ideology that builds monuments and tombs and holds multiple annual holidays to encourage living people to follow the dead to the slaughter? Do you know any other system but the nation-state that honors conquerors and colonizers? Because mass murder is fine and slavery excusable if it built my country. To wrap up this video, let's think about where this cult is taking us. There's a great risk that the current surge in the power of white nationalists will lead to a new kind of fascist regime in the United States, as it has already in some of the states. 
However, while a lot of people have become reactionaries, plenty more have become radicals. You know, the opposite of reactionaries. So whatever the fascists do, at least they'll face resistance. It's possible the U.S. and other states will be torn apart by civil war initiated by the right wing in a bid for power. But the coup of January 6, 2021 was bound to fail. Fascists come to power in elections, not coups. They work through the system in order to destroy it. Because we're taught to believe winning an election legitimizes wielding power over everyone, many or most people will consider it wrong to resist even a fascist government. They need to open their eyes and act now before it's too late.